Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for today, March 15th, 2021. We should begin today by referencing the importance of this date from many, many years ago, immortalized in the work of Shakespeare in his play Julius Caesar, where the soothsayer warned Caesar, the, the newly crowned emperor, Caesar, beware the Ides of March. Well, today's would-be emperors would be well advised to heed that warning, as was made clear by an interview that was done uh, just the other day with the, a leading figure in the American command in the Indo-Pacific, a man named Lieutenant General Clinton Hynote. Now, Hynote was reporting on a war game that took place last fall uh, based on the idea of the U.S. and China entering into a confrontation in 10 years, a battle in the Indo-Pacific region. And, and what it was, the, the war game was based on the idea that China was using a, their own military exercise as a cover, but under the cover of that exercise would launch a bioweapon attack on the U.S. bases and warships in the Pacific to be followed by missile strikes on U.S. bases and an air and amphibious assault on Taiwan. Now, these reports were classified, but for some reason, High Note came forward and gave an interview which was published on Yahoo News, Yahoo News and Defense One. Uh, High Note is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategy, Integration, and Requirements. And here's what he said. He said, China is building an effective counter capability to U.S. strategy. Now, he's referring to the uh, strategy that was developed around 2010 called the Air-Sea Battle Strategy, which is based largely on using positions, uh, stationary positions in the Pacific, including Guam, some island spots, uh, Hawaii, and also perhaps bringing in Australia, Japan, and other allies to provide a base, but this is, pr creates a target as opposed to an effective strategy, and the Chinese are building their counter strategy based on the air-sea battle war strategy of the U.S. And what High Note said is that the trend in these war games is not just that we are losing, but that we are losing faster. Now, he said that when this was reported to the Air Force uh, Secretary and the Chief of Staff, and they asked, what should we do? The person who devised the war game said, quote, we should never play this war game scenario again because we know what is going to happen, unquote. Now, what happened to change? So far, nothing except a new buildup around the idea of an Asian NATO. The question is, did anyone ever consider the prospect of diplomacy, of negotiations, as an alternative? Now, that would be the proper thing to do. But you should, first of all, consider that High Note's public interview may be part of an overall strategy of the military-industrial complex to ask for more money, which they always do. Uh, this was Admiral Davidson the uh, commander of the Indo-Pacific region of the U.S. military, who testified earlier in the week, last week, that the United States needs an additional $4.2 billion to upgrade its missile defense forces and its strike capabilities. So, of course, there's always the demand for more money. But the question is, what is the U.S. posture? Is it defensible? Is it reasonable? And isn't it more uh, legitimate to actually consider why would we head to war with China? Are there really such terrible con contradictions that would lead us to the point of having to have a strike? Now, this is the background for the development of the so-called Quad Nations, the Quad Military Alliance, what some people call an Asian NATO. This is to bring in India, Japan, Australia, and the United States into a military alliance and last Friday, President Biden had a discussion with the presidents or prime ministers of those other countries to talk about doing that. The main topic they talked about was vaccine diplomacy and partly building up India's capability, but for what purpose? 
to counter China. Instead of supplementing what China is doing with vaccines, they want to make sure they could counter China. But the China issue is in the background. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what this quad idea represents. Uh, it was launched following the devastating tsunami in Indonesia in 2004 as a relief effort between the United States, India, Australia, and Japan. But the idea that it could serve as a military alliance owes its uh, origins to none other than leading war hawk and war criminal Dick Cheney in 2007, uh, who said, we need to have a capability to contain China. Now, this was then fleshed out in a report by a neocon think tank called the Center for New American Strategy, which published a report in 2008 which called for increased American engagement in Asia. And here was their argument. They said in the early 21st century, quote, America's strategic preoccupation in Iraq and Afghanistan is undermining its ability to adapt to the major power shifts in the Asia Pacific that are actively challenging America's traditional balance of power role in the region, unquote. Now, they didn't mention that part of this strategic preoccupation was based on the same people who are writing this new report, the same Project for New American Century, Century Unilateralist War Hawks. And this was picked up by people in both parties, including then-presidential candidate Barack Obama, who called for a new worldwide concert of democracies to come together to counter Russian and Chinese influence. Now, this idea then morphed into the 2010 air-sea battle concept. What's the operational plan to confront China? The economic warfare component of this was the Trans-Pacific Partnership for Free Trade, in which the, uh, Obama himself said the TPP allows America and not countries like China, to write the rules of the road in the 21st century, unquote. Well, this was an exclusionary intention. The Chinese said, well, okay, why don't you join us in the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank to participate in funding projects in Asia? The United States, that is the Obama administration, not only declined, but lobbied other countries to join them in boycotting the AIIB. Now, this demand to consolidate an Asian NATO uh, includes a diplomatic side, which was provided by the Atlantic Council, which was one of the agencies that, that was directly involved in the Russiagate hoax against Donald Trump uh, and continues to be a leader in putting out diatribes against Russia and China. Most recently, they formulated something called a D-10 committee, which would be to turn the G7 into a larger organization, including Australia, India, and Japan. And this is adopted by Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, who now appears to be making a tilt toward this anti-China policy. There's a British Defense Review, which is expected out today, but the preliminary report on it is that the Brits want to get back in a big way in the Indo-Pacific region. This is the old British imperial stomping ground, going back to the extension from the Indian subcontinent into China, which was uh, concretized with the opium wars against China in 1839 and again in 1859, when the British fleet was sent to transport Indian opium into China to deal with a balance of trade problem. And when the Chinese rebelled against it, the British fleet went in and attacked China in the second one in 59. They leveled some cities, and that's when they took over Hong Kong and set up the infamous dope bank, money, dope money laundering bank, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and now the infamous HSBC. So the tilt to the region under Johnson now is part of the global Britain strategy, uh, and it's designed to join U.S. military containment of China. Now, some are saying that this is replacing europhobia with xenophobia. And Johnson previously was known as someone supporting work with China. So what happened? Well, the, the UK is, is going through an incredible crisis right now. 
We see it with the reshaping of the monarchy around the Meghan and Harry deal, but it's also that they're playing a leading role in organizing the Great Reset. And this is a component of that, the military containment of China and Russia, because Russia and China oppose the Great Reset and the Green New Deal. But what can the UK add militarily? You know, there, many of their boats and ships are rotting and are rusty and are on dry dock being repaired. Their aircraft carriers lack British squadrons and have to use uh, F-35s from the US Marine Corps. So what benefit would they provide other than to show a unified force, which is backed up by NATO with NATO discussion of joining the containment policy of the United States in the Indo-Pacific? So uh, this was denounced by the military, the chief military diplomatic correspondent for The Guardian, saying it's a militarily dangerous imperial fantasy that the British could add something as part of a containment of China. Now, it brings me back to the original point. Why not try diplomacy? The idea of a war with China based on a provocation that would lead the Chinese to militarily seize Taiwan, which would then trigger a U.S. response, would immediately go to nuclear war. Is it worth it? Taiwan, we've recognized for many, many years as part of China, the so-called two-China policy, which is two systems but one China. So what would be the point of provoking a war with China, except to protect the bankrupt financial system, which the Chinese, the Russians, and other countries are moving away from through their rejection of the Green New Deal and the Great Reset. So now is the time, instead of allowing these imperial fantasies to determine spending policy, and we're talking not just 4.2 billion, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars that will go into this. This is what Donald Trump ran against in 2016. The unrestrained spending on military uh, components, military logistics for wars that do nothing but drain our treasury and kill our young people and destroy nations. Why should we have a regime change policy towards Russia and China when we just saw what happened with a regime change policy run by the same people against Trump in the United States? So before we get into this next war, we have to step back. This is where Lyndon LaRouche was absolutely right. To counter the British Empire, you need an alliance of four powers, the United States, Russia, China, and India. And that's where our efforts should be oriented, as opposed to a new Cold War leading to a hot war to contain China and Russia. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll be back again tomorrow.